What's up, you guys? How are you doing today? This is It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I have Jordan Edwards here. How are you What's doing? What's going on, Demi? Woohoo. Okay. Well, we have Ben and James of The Knox today, and we are going to talk about the new music that they have out with Parson James came out October 22nd, uh, and their incredible journey to the top of the music industry food chain. Please welcome The Knox. What's going on, guys? What's up, guys? Well, that was such a flattering intro, Demi. Way to go. <laughs> Off of the music industry food chain. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Move well, out I'm of the way. California Move out right of now, way. and it's like everyone's doing music. I'm sure you guys know there's new artists all over the place all day long, but you guys have just done what seems to be the impossible on um, hit songs, uh, crazy collabs. You've collabed with almost everybody. And yeah. uh, I really want to know where did you guys start? Like, where did it all start with you guys? Where did you meet? Uh, a small room in Alphabet City. Mm -hmm. Two small rooms in Alphabet City, actually. Alphabet City, actually. Yeah, we were uh, roommates first, actually. We like met a mutual friend. When we, I was in college, and he was in college, and uh, we both needed to get the fuck out of our dorms. And uh, and we both made music, so we kind of were introduced, like, hey, you guys should be friends. And then, uh, yeah, we became roommates and started making music together slowly. Um, at first, we were kind of doing our own thing, and then we just kind of started collaborating. And over a couple of years, we started doing the Knox stuff. Um, started off as just doing remixes and all that, and then started a couple of originals just for fun, and then it kind of just snowballed over time. At what point did you guys become the Knox? I think it was after this mixtape we put out with DJ Benji. Yeah. It was just like needed a name. Uh, to go along with the mixtape, and then uh, we had this thing that we did uh, called getting the knocks whenever we would a neighbor would knock on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's on the Wikipedia page, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the thing that, like, yeah. So we, we you know, that was what we went with. In uh, I think there was like one other band ever, like the Japanese. Uh, yeah, there's a Japanese band called the Knocks, and like, we uh. Oh, my dog is squeaking his foot. Um, we, uh, hey, dog. we, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we like got the name like copywritten or whatever, and they like asked mm -hmm. us if we wanted to cease and desist, but we said we could leave the Japanese punk band because it felt kind of cool. Yeah, that was nice of you guys. That was nice of you guys. We got a uh, VR taking care of the uh, the dog situation over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about. Oh. Did we get a dog cameo? Did I miss it? Oh, he's running around. He's too crazy. Oh, okay, okay, because we we welcome we welcome pet cameos on the show. We've <laughs> we had some we've had some some uh, some furry friends. I got a favorite right here. Oh, there we go. That's good enough. <laughs> That's pet. your pet. It's not a That's pet. your pet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. And I don't What's I don't even have a stuffed animal. I feel really left now. I'm in bed. I, I, love, I love the Red and Snoopy thing. I love I love the Nick old old school Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah. Love, it, love it. Um, before we get into the new music, you guys had this kind of legendary studio. I don't know what the 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 current status of it is, but you used to have this like legendary studio down in Chinatown, uh, fifty five studio. What's the status on that? Is that completely gone? Like, what's the yeah. Deal? Uh... Uh, like this event space people, they brought it and turned it into like the, this after hours situation. Uh, well, actually that's like, that was before the pandemic. So I don't know what it is now, but. Uh, yeah, it was classic gentrification really. Fun fact, mm -hmm. the building used to be owned by the Beastie Boys back in the day and they had our, their first rehearsal studio. So it's actually legendary. Like Yeah, like on the same floor and they actually have a song called 59 Christie Street, which the building is 55-59. So they had a song called 59 on Christie Street, and then we, our album was called 55. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a, you know, we uh, we were there for years, and it was like a, one of those weird little Chinatown basements, and uh, slowly some get rich guy went and bought it and turned it into a bunch of like bougie rooms to rent for parties, and then got a rent. I think he got basically in trouble because it was very illegal. And uh, yeah, 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 it was That's some New York I, shit. I played there. a couple parties there. It was really illegal, but. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't get fun. more. We had a lot of people come through there, man, because we used to work with a lot of hip hop people. So we had like Rakim was there. We had 50 Cent through there once. We had uh, oh. uh, Nicki Minaj recorded there when she was like, she had to be like 18 or some shit. Like she wasn't even popping yet. She was still part of Dipset and that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. It was Blanco. 
Yeah, Benny Blanco worked out there for a little Dr. bit. Dr. Luke was there. One time we had a party yeah. came and played his Katy Perry stuff before we was out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's where it all started. We kind of like, before we even had stuff going, we had the studio first and kind of did the whole like fake it till you make it thing. You know, we pretended we had this like big studio with like little office and interns and we really didn't have, we were still broken. <laughs> there was nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> little entry area with like a computer as if there was going to be like a. It was cool. We just, we just used to chill there and like smoke a bunch of weed and, and, and make a lot of music, you know? Yeah. So it worked out in the long run, but it was definitely a gamble at first. The good old days. The good yeah. old days. I still smoke a bunch of weed and make a lot of music, just not at, not at that space. You smoke better weed now, right? You got more money, you smoke better weed. Yeah, yeah. Dude, uh, <laughs> well, weed's a lot more accessible now. Than We're people. also not buying 20 bags anymore. It was a lot of Yeah, it's, it's like, yeah. Dime. <laughs> We're oh my God, that's so New York, a dime or a dub. Uh, yeah. You guys became the Knox. It's like fate or something like that. But I'm really curious. Um, I feel like... Not many people know about you, your guys' individual stories of music. Um, and I'd like to talk about that. So starting with James, like, what happened? You're a kid, you hear a song, and you're like, I'm going to be a musician. <laughs> that's what happened. That's, that's, <laughs> um, no, my, uh, my actual, actually, my dad and my mom are both uh, involved in music. Like, my whole family on both sides. My mom's side is a bunch of... Uh, church organist and my dad is a church organist and he does like um uh MDing, i guess was what you would call it for for churches he goes around and like does all the sound and like writes a bunch of songs from them like both kind of like bolsters they like the music departments um, <clears throat> and yeah so as kids and uh as his family we just kind of like would roll around with my dad to different churches we had a main church that we went to too but I don't know, just a lot of music in general. And then my mom would like be the director of music with him, like the, the co-director of music with him. And they'd both go around the churches and we'd kind of like be their music department for like a few years and then before we'd like go to, go to the next church. And then I played in um, jazz rock bands in high school growing up. Um, when I first moved to the city, I was trying to do a uh, the like instrumentalist musician thing where I would like play in bands and I played for a bunch of bands. I was like the keyboardist for the Americans and oh. I like started my own couple of bands and stuff. So really just like a lot of like gospel and uh, like funk shit. I'm sorry, stuff, funk stuff. You can uh, drop four letter words here. All right. <laughs> this is not a children's program. <laughs> yeah, it's just like gospel shit, like a lot of funk stuff. Um, I didn't even really get into dance music like production wise until we got together and we started like even when we first got together like i said we were doing like hot hip-hop stuff and then uh i think we moved into the dance world after we discovered that hip-hop was kind of like the wild wild west as far as like like finances and like contracts and stuff are involved so like um yeah that's do you play any instruments? You play any brass or anything like that? I don't play any brass. I play uh, I play piano. I play uh, drums. I started playing drums. Like it's hard to play drums in the city. Like you, there's nowhere to have a drum set in your apartment. Uh, so I haven't played in a while. But I play guitar a little bit. I play some bass. I played bass in our last live show. Uh, and I don't play any brass. I like I, I like fucked around like with saxophone and trumpet. I couldn't. It's like it's too hard. I think I don't have the lungs for it. Skinny guy. Yeah. Mm. Nice, nice. And uh, so, what else? You know, you. Oh, I'm sorry, Denny. You, you were going to go go across here. Um, yes, Ben. Yeah. So that's what him. is your story? When did it start? When were you? Like, uh, be a I have quite a different background than James, which is, I think, why we hit it off so well. And our music is what it is. I think I grew up in a non-musical household. My parents didn't play any instruments. No one in my family did besides like, you know, we all tried to do the, you have to like play an instrument in school. And I think I tried like flute or something. I don't remember. Flute? Oh, the recorder. <laughs> was it the recorder? Yeah, yeah one of those. <laughs> my parents were huge music fans and it was like a like, huge music fans. I like, grew up with a shrine to Bruce Springsteen in my house and, and all my mom would do is, you know, every day in the car, listen to the radio and tell me different facts about different bands. And she was, you know, my dad was a huge Grateful Dead guy and, uh 
just a lot of music in the household in general. And I was just a huge fan. My sister, my oldest, I have two older sisters and one was a huge uh, kind of punk rock fan. A lot of alternative music. Grew up hearing a lot of these, like, uh, she used to get all the seven inches from the cool, like, girl punk bands back in the day before oh. that stuff really blew up. And it was a huge influence, just the whole, like, alternative music. She gave me my first DJ Shadow album and Daft Punk and stuff that, like, really put me onto that world, Moby. Um, and that was a huge influence of mine back in the day was, like, a lot of the kind of trip-hop and producer-based electronica music, um, which kind of led into slowly into hip hop and just beat bass music in general. And then I, I uh, moved to New York to go to college and I had already found a manager to kind of help me. At the time I'd been making a lot of beats and sending them out. I had like a, I was heavy on the internet. So I was, I grew up in Vermont and New Hampshire where like- Vermont. Yeah, there wasn't much of a- <laughs> Give me shouts at Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Vermont, no, my aunt's from Vermont. That's beautiful. You guys have like little uh, like wires in, in the trees that have maple syrup, like oh, literally. Yeah. Oh yeah, there <laughs> so there wasn't much of a scene, uh, obviously in Vermont and that kind of stuff. But you know, I, even at the time, I was still in a hip hop group. Shout out High Flow, my old like uh, white rap group from the woods, and uh, <laughs> and I used to just you know do everything I can. We threw shows at rec centers. We like I really tried, and then I was like, you know, I got to go to New York. This is why I want to do this. And I met a manager on on uh, through people on the internet, like MySpace days, and had a guy helping me like kind of sell some beats and whatnot. And it kind of just like, you know, I just hustled. It was like, we tried everything, man. When me and JPEG lived together, we were trying to sign rappers to produce them and make their mixtapes. We started a label, we didn't even know what that meant. Just, just I had used to ship mixtapes down to Miami to random dudes to try to sell them. It was just like, yeah. it was a whole nother hustle. You know, there was no Spotify. No, it makes it sound old, but there was no, no really online stuff besides MySpace and, you know, Twitter was like just starting. So it was like, you really had to just hustle it in real life. And we'd go to, JPEG would go to beat battles and try to make money from like, winning beat battles i was dj i did a lot of dj battle stuff when i was a kid um and and yeah it's just like and then it was great when we met because j pad is such a trained musician you know he comes from it's like in his blood and i on the other side was very much beat based and kind of more on the weird playing with sounds kind of thing so together i'm like, classically trained yeah i'm classically trained just trained um like but, around. I looked at JPAD as like a live living sample, you know, because I couldn't play any instruments at the time. Now I can play piano finally. I played some drums, but but he was but he was just so good on the keys and the on musically on the music side that like together it really like became this crazy uh, genre fuck kind of. Speaking of the internet and kind of using um, and having that having access to that many more people. How do you, do you and seeing both sides of it? Do you guys prefer that, or do you kind of wish we were still back in the like, let's send a mix it to Miami and see what happens? That's a good question. Um, there, there, there are elements. Do we, of, do we prefer what? Or, or the, I'm sorry, ten years last year. Pre-internet streaming days, basically. Yeah. Oh, oh, I hear. What I miss is like the scene, the idea of a scene that's kind of dead now. You know, when we moved to New York, you'd have to like go to Lit Lounge and see all these cool bands play. Like, you'd catch like you go to a party and see the Strokes guys there or whatever. It's like, it was like, it was a scene before. And now it's like, I think the internet kind of killed the scene. Um, it's dead. It's completely dead. Like, and people try dead. to say that it's not, I mean, maybe there's still a scene for like ravers and stuff like that a little bit, you know, but, but that's like, like a different that, scene. That, it's yeah. not as cool for sure. Yeah. And, and when it comes to real music and like bands, like there's no place like, Oh, there's no live there. scene. Yeah, there's no live place we go. Like, if I know I go to this venue on a Friday night, I'm going to catch the new cool no. band. That I, that there's I no, like, it. underground live scene at all. It died with Shea Stadium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, mm. like, I can only go get the album if I go to the show. Now it's like, oh, I can look up their whole history on the internet, and I know I don't want to go, or I can see who's already at the party, so I don't want to show up. It looks whack. So yeah. it's like, that's the part I miss. But, I, I mean, we've yeah, been... That's crazy to say Shea Stadium. That was, like, the last one, like, the yeah. last, like, alternative live venue that I can pick up. But we owe yeah. a lot at the same time we owe a lot to the internet and like streaming has been really good for us and and we've done a lot of our collaborations due to meeting people and doing remote work and so it's like you know it's a double-edged sword but i do miss the scene a lot and i feel like uh you know i i, I feel very lucky to have been around at least like for the last dying breath of the them. little bits of it yeah because yeah. then you read books like uh meet me in the bathroom or whatever and then you're like damn the seed back then was like even more like raw because there's like i don't know, it seems like the more connectivity 
there became the well, more the scene kind of disintegrated because it felt like you needed to like be there less and less because you could hear about it or like get it instantly, you know. Yeah. And Demi, Demi is Demi is she hung on to New York as long as she could, and now she's in LA. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, now, I want to uh, shout out people like you know Blue to Tiger Denver. and Mia Barron. Oh yeah, for sure. Who have stuck around New York, you know. Yeah, and there is, and there's still like you know we have friends like, like like Blue and Richie Quake and this girl Anna Shoemaker. There's still like some young artists that are really doing it in New York still, and, like playing live shows and like starting from the ground up and really doing a DIY, which I really fuck with, and it's it's nice to see. I feel like there is a weird shift happening right now because it was so oversaturated on the internet with people just like being like, oh, I can be an artist and just be on Instagram and Spotify. And then they're realizing that that doesn't really pan out, that you really need to have a groundswell and build up a real, per- you have mm-hmm. to be a person. You can't just exist on the internet mm-hmm. unless you're an influencer or something. So like, so I do feel like, like Blue, for example, like she might've popped off on the internet, you know, she did TikTok or whatever, which was great, but uh, she was around, man. She was like, I met the, re- the way we met her and started working with her is because she was in the scene. She was DJing every party she could. She'd bring her bass to any place she could and jump on and play bass along to the DJs. She was like 18 playing with 30 year old DJs. Yeah. Like she, she busted her ass. And like people who do that, it pays off. And a lot of people, I think, right now think that you can just put a song on the internet and have an Instagram account and you're going to have a real following and maybe you'll have a, a flash in the pan hit, but it's not going to build up to anything really. You got to hit that first level. I mean, you can get yeah. the viral you know traction but you right. have to get through that first that first ground level that first shell yeah it takes you can... and, it, and the proof is in the pudding you know a lot of these tiktok artists and shit they're not selling tickets you know um, um yeah so it's it's a it's interesting it's like it's in a weird flux right now but i do feel like gen z and all these kids are like having this whole kind of revert to like diy and like early late 90s vibes where people want to be grungy and go listen to like a noise rock band which is great so i hope My... that, i hope that keeps going i have a theory that I think a lot of the people who are under 25 who are really into the DIY thing, who also Demi and I talk about on the show, the resurgence of rock guitar based music that's coming out. Yeah. I feel like a lot of those people feel like they, they, they were left out. They, they missed the boat of pre Spotify, pre streaming. And they feel like there's yeah. like a yearning to, to experience that a little bit. We talk about it all the time that, that whole era, that little blind spot in music, like in the early, I guess it was like 2009 or eight to 2015 or something is also when we came out, but we kind of made it through the other end. There were a lot of bands that uh, got lost there. Like a lot of it, like does offend you. Yeah. Uh, or like um. that whole era of like, black <laughs> kids and like, and, and a lot of like bloggy, you call it like bloggy alt rock stuff. That was kind of like post MGMT post hype machine bands. Is hype machine bands. It. Yeah, exactly. A lot of them didn't get to see the other side because there was no streaming. And like, it was like this false sense of inflation because you had number one on hype machine, but it didn't really pan out, whatever. I don't know why, but there's so much good music from that era that still is out there. And I think that sound is kind of coming back, which is what we're trying to do on our next album is kind of like a, re- a revert to that original sound that kind of brought us out of uh, where we came from. That's a good, that's a good uh, trend transition there. Uh, J rock. We, uh, uh, yeah. rock. We have a, um, you guys have been releasing singles the last year or so um, leading up to, you just announced yesterday. I saw an article from yesterday. I don't know if the announcement was actually yesterday, but you guys announced your, your new album, your, yeah. your third album, I guess it is. So talk about that whole situation. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I don't know. Uh, when did we start it, JPAT? I guess that was oh yeah, like uh, two years ago. It's almost gonna be, yeah, it's almost gonna be exactly two years because we went to LA to kick it off right before the pandemic. And even before that, we kind of were like throwing kicking ideas around. Yeah, so this has been a long time coming. I, it's one of my favorite records we've done. I think just because we've had so much time on it, you know, it feels like we've had these two years to really sit and like sift through it and and make it really great. And and uh, I don't know. I feel like people say there's a sophomore slump, which I kind of feel like we hit maybe in our last album, we were a little lost in the sauce on it. Yeah. And then we just like had different ideas. Like that. Yeah. That we were, takes, that I think we so, wanted to be, that's I think pretty, that's really, pretty nice of you that you guys admit that your last album wasn't your greatest. <laughs> I think we just really, it was, I like a lot of parts of our last album and like, like, <laughs> like a DJ and like a music and like a less, more like live side of, of like our music that like, we kind of toe the line a little bit. And then I think that like kind of represents us too. Like last, like the last album, we really wanted to like go and like be a band and like 
do yeah. like the full tour thing with like our group and like and like and that like was representative of like the music and the music was really good it's just like like we were just saying we came out during a time then where like it was like a lot of hype machine stuff and like a lot of electronic stuff so we weren't really like a live act ever it was more like a dj duo kind of like hybrid thing and we just like pushed the live part of it and it wasn't like i don't know it wasn't like as fruitful as i feel like we thought it was going to be but it was fun yeah and i think i think we tried to be a little bit more as artists more like you know like we doing more frontman a little more indie we had a song on all radio with foster the people which kind of got in our head a little bit i think and and now we're going back to really being producers and and really pushing just that side of what is our strength which is i think producing and and using features and working with other artists and being taste yeah. makers in that sense because at the end of the day we've always been dance guys like we, are, we come from like djing yeah and clubs and shit and like we, we test our music out on dance floors and we don't test our music out like at live venues so we still try to keep it fresh like this album is still not it's not all it's not like house music it's still indie dance you know um mm -hmm. but we like to really like we feel like we kind of took that hype machine vibe of indie dance and tried to put it almost on a a bigger scale We've mentioned Blue, and we mentioned you mentioned the Foster the People single. You guys have collaborated with Wyclef and Carly Rae Jepsen, and all these huge people. At this point, you guys got to get to kind of pick and choose on your collaborations. I mean, you start from scratch and be like, "This is our wish list." Like, how does that work? Yeah, it kind of changes. <clears throat> you know, there's still some people that you know we get turned down, and then we turn other people down, and vice versa. But it's, it's like, like a dating app, but for it is. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> It depends on the song too because sometimes we'll have a song that like we wrote or someone else wrote with us and we'll be like man like the Carly Rae Jepsen song for example like we had that whole song written even the Foster the People song we had fully written and we were like man like Mark would Mark Foster would fucking crush this he's made for this and usually that doesn't work because a guy like Mark who's like a real artist like he's a real songwriter like they don't want to cut someone else's song you know because they, they feel like they're not attached to it but people with the open mind that like Carly did it too and 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 they were down and Sometimes it works that way. Sometimes people won't cut it, or sometimes you send an idea out to someone, they send it right back with something. It's just like a total fluke. It's like how the person's feeling that day. And, you know, there's also all these other factors involved. You know, like a lot of newer artists don't want to work with certain people because they might not be hot at the moment, or they might not be the new hot thing and they're scared about their whatever. We don't really care about that. Like, we have features with on this new album of people you've never heard of, but the song is great, and that's what matters to us. Speaking of Wyclef, we've had Wyclef was our 50th episode. Oh, amazing. He's a I literally tell people he's the most inspirational person I've ever spoken to. Yeah. Um, how was it working with Wyclef? Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, like, he's, he's like one of my idols. You know, I grew up Fuji's. That record was one of my favorite albums of all time. And that was like a weird pinch me moment. I think we got a call and all of a sudden it's like, yo, you want to work with Wyclef? And next week we're at his house for two weeks. Yeah. No. Did you go to this? Demi did this whole thing because he took us in our, he was on his phone and he took us in his bedroom. He had all these mirrors everywhere. Did you, did, did, did... It's, yeah. He's got a sick, like real, like Jersey rapper house, you know, it's, it's like. Yeah, huge. Like, <laughs> yeah. Jersey rapper house. I love that. I love yeah, that. He's, got, he's got the guest house that has the studio and the club in the basement and the, in the movie mm -hmm. theater. It's like some real MTV cribs. He's got the yeah, super pink my righty. Yeah, and we, you know we we got so close with him. We ended up like producing a lot for this record, like for his his own stuff. We went out to LA with him, and we were like family, man. We were at his like daughter's birthday party at, out in Jersey, and he's like, it was such a crazy moment because you're sitting there like working with this guy who has literally worked with everyone from Carlos Santana to fucking Beyonce, and he's, yeah. and yeah, and he's taking notes from us. You know, we're trying to tell him like, oh, you, yeah. should, you should hit that that fucking ad lib again and we're just like what i'm telling wyclef what to do it was crazy uh and then but he listened and that's why he's a smart musician a smart guy because he really has always had his ear to the ground for younger artists and understood that like and that's how you stay relevant too. that's, that's how, you how you stay how relevant, you stay relevant is by working with younger people and taking notes and like he but at the same time he's sitting there telling us stories about how he was on stage with tupac and biggie and like a tiger yeah. and like yeah he brought a lion on stage <laughs> yeah <laughs> It was, it was like probably one of my favorite experiences I've ever had. I'm actually going to the Fuji's reunion show in Jersey next month, which I'm very excited about. Wow. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. It must be nice. Uh, now, <clears throat> now you have this album coming out and you have, you know, all these collaborations. What's your live situation going to be like the next time you go out? That's a hot topic right now. Uh, we're literally just in a Zoom about this. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. It's not going to be the band. Yeah. It's actually just two of us. It's going to be way more electronic, I think. It won't be a DJ set, but it'll be a, we have a whole like visual kind of like. It'll be more of an experience. Yeah, this whole immersive experience plan where it's going to be very much uh, a little bit more on like, you know, the electronic side, less of like we're an indie band. You know, we had like a five piece band with live drums. We had blue playing bass for us. We had. Yes. It was, and it was great, but this is going to be way more, uh, way more kind of immersive, like maybe get a little fucked up before you show up and have a good time, you know? I'll probably still be talking some shit on the mic. Yeah. yeah. You got me hyped. I'm ready to see it. I don't know when you're playing or what you're playing. But yeah, I we're going to announce right tour dates next month. We got some locked in. We're just kind of smoothing it all out right now. Okay. This is, this is a good I'm, teaser then. This is a good setup. For yeah, you. exactly. I'm between, I'm between the... I'm trying to like cast this to my big screen, but I can't figure it out. <laughs> so. Your guys' influence influences musically range from disco to funk, classic rock. And I'm actually curious because with all the new artists now, we spoke about TikTok kids, you know, becoming artists, whatever. But who are you guys working with today? Who are you guys inspired by today? Yeah, that's a good question. I really per personally, uh, you know, me and JPA have very similar tastes, and then we also have very different tastes. Where I love listening to like Phoebe Bridgers and a lot of like little sad folk music, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of like the whole movement. Uh, I think there's a lot of like fake Phoebe Bridgers out there right now. Uh, but I there's love a lot of people who want to sound like her voice. Yeah, which, her which is voice. getting a little exhausting already. But like, I obviously mm -hmm. that always when someone great comes, like people all try to sound like them. But uh, Besides that, I like that guy, Dominic Fike. I like some of his stuff. I think he's like kind of doing something interesting. I know he's he's like working with Rick Rubin and shit right now, so I think he's gonna have yeah, a good Yeah, he turned us down. To, oh, he did. For us. Oh my God. He's cool. Uh, outside of that, a lot, I really like um, a lot of this lo-fi house stuff happening right now, like this guy Fred again, and um, uh, uh, the Ross from Friends. It's like kind of weirdo, like electronica stuff that's that's coming from the UK and stuff, which I'm into. Um, and I love the 1975. That's like my guilty pleasure pop band. I guess they're not even like pop. They're cooler than that. But I love the 1975. Episodes. Are you guys fans of the new? Did you hear the new Lana Del Rey album? Yeah. I haven't listened yet. It's on. It's on my queue though. I'm I'm I'm, I'm ready for it. Is it good? Because the last one was kind of like. I didn't love the last one. She's she putting out so much music, which I love. She put out a full album a few months ago. I feel like. No, but I mean, I think because she also deleted her social media like all at once. Yeah, cool. yeah, I saw that. That was the first thing I did was did look at her on Instagram when she released that album. Um, do you guys ever feel like just deleting your social media? Oh my god, all the time. <laughs> I actually did during the pandemic. I didn't have a personal Instagram account. I took it down. I just like couldn't handle all the stuff going on. Um, because it's like it's just constant content from everyone you know so and everyone you should know. I had to, I had to stop like, being on Facebook. So, yeah. so that asked guys, I was talking to Demi the other day and she's gone out to LA and she was saying one of the big differences between LA and New York is in LA, everybody wants to show you their shit. Everyone wants to like pull up their Instagram and be like, I did this with this person. Right. I did this with this person. Look at this new thing I made. And you don't get that in New York. Not nearly as much. Not as much. No, not as much as her. I mean, the thing about LA though, is like, I, it's funny. I was just there. I'm working with this new artist that I'm developing and she, you know, we're allowed to do some sessions and that's a, the one place you can go to do it now. Like as much as LA is like a lot with that, it's still, there's a lot of up and coming, exciting music happening there. And I think it's a place that you can live. Like we're lucky we made it. I feel like just under the cut where we were successful enough to be able to afford to live in New York and be a musician. Mm -hmm. When a lot of people in New York who are like just starting can't really afford it. And like in LA, there's just a little bit more collaboration. There's more people to work with, but at the same time, you got to like brush away all the, it's super LA coming at you because there's so much of it. But if you if you dig through all the bullshit, there is some really cool like new stuff happening out there. And I think like it is the new city for starving artists, in my opinion. Because I mean, look at Manhattan has become like a Midwest college campus now. It's like it's not what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> a Midwest college campus. Wow, that's so cool. It's bleak out there, but but like. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, but but LA LA's got some shit going on. It's just like you got to deal with that. Like for every one cool person you meet, you got to deal with like nine fakers that are trying to trying to sell you on something. Do you, do you guys do you guys have cool cars now? <laughs> I have a four. Yeah. I I live in Brooklyn. Okay, <laughs> awesome. I have an e-scooter. I moved upstate, <laughs> so I, I got a house and shit. But I got a, a Toyota Four Runner. It's my baby. I like it. 
That's still this good for do you go do you go on excursions out there? Do you load no, the dogs in the back of the truck and the only one I could get was like the uh like the off-road version. So I have it and it has all these buttons. I have no what the fuck it does. I, I just take it to the fucking grocery store. So uh someday it I'll looks cool. I'll take it on some dirt. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like yeah. the two artists don't really like, I don't care about what car. No. It's like, Everyone's got like a Tesla and all that shit. I mean I guess LA, you spend way more time in your car, so it's like yeah. I feel like if I had to spend time in my car, I would like spend more time on it. Yeah. Yo, mine, but those new electric car trucks car. look so. Those new electric truck looks so good though. Oh, like with the Blade the, Runner things, those are crazy. Yeah, like the, the yeah, Cybertruck, truck, but also even like the Ford Lightning. Oh yeah, those, yeah, those are cool. Yeah, I feel yeah. like it's a matter of time before like that's the norm everywhere. Because I love big trucks and SUVs, <laughs> with the gas mileage and just like right. the the maintenance. But when you take that away, and you don't have to worry about getting 12 miles a gallon like it just opens so many things that's up. Why i got a forerunner i want you know i wanted like something that's boxy i don't want one of these like soccer mom space cars you need a g-wagon uh, yeah that's, a, -wagon that's a real flex that's what j-pat's got to get to push around brooklyn i think yeah yeah like, like, Chris can't ever you find parking wagon up there. down broadway in yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the thing some of my homies have cars here in, Bro in brooklyn and they'll be like oh like let me drive you to like wherever I got to go, and then I'm at first I'm like yeah for sure, and then I'm like ah because then like there's never any parking. We always spend like an hour <laughs> for parking. I, what's crazy me is when you're in Brooklyn, you see somebody's Maserati, you see like a Maserati parked on the yeah, street. Yeah, there's, some, like, there's some crazy shit. Out here. What are you doing? Like on Knickerbocker. Yes, exactly. So like, nice car, car like, Knickerbocker. Yeah, if I was driving a fancy car like that in Hudson Valley, I'd get like the stink eye from all the rednecks. Be like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> All right, before we let you go, guys, um, one thing we didn't really talk about, um, when I have electronic mus musicians up here, guys who do uh, women, anybody who does DJ, people who do DJ, DJ sets, I'm always interested in the craziest place you've played or done a set in, most exotic, most interesting, weirdest, do you mm -hmm. need anything come to, come to mind from that? I'd say um, Richard Branson's. Yeah, I did Richard Branson's little island thing. Okay, pause it. Tell tell us all about that. What was that like? Did you fly in on a private plane? Like, tell us the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, and boat. And a, and boat. It, was, it, was, it, was, it was one of his good friends, like one of his, like, gambling. You know, who's that guy who takes the photos with the guns and the girls all the time? Oh, uh, fucking, um, you know, the guy. He's Bob Valerian. Like, Matt, yeah, Bob Valerian. He fell off so, now, but, but, like, part of that whole crew of, like, ridiculous, rich gambling people. Crazy and, people, and, yeah. And they had their party at, at whatever it's called, his private island in the wherever it is, but uh, uh, British, British Virgin Islands. So we're in the middle of tour and we had to like get off, like leave the bus and get right. on a plane, go to right. the British right. Farm stage. Yeah. And then go on this boat where they like drove us through the, they, cause I think they didn't want us to have to deal with customs. So they drove us at night. So we're like getting like basically like shipped to this Island in the pitch black on this tiny boat with this woman who's like runs the Island or whatever. And then we pull up and it's like, it's literally like, it's like Dr. Seuss. There's like monkeys and there's pair, they like imported all these animals and there's like reptiles, like, but it's like, a, it's his own fucking island. It's insane. They're, They're talking like, to us and shit. Yeah, helicopter. Like animals were talking to us. All these birds talking to us. <laughs> it was like, and then we just DJed a party for like, what? It was like 20 people. Like, it wasn't even that, it was like a private. Like party. Kind of funny. Yeah, it wasn't even that many people. It sounds like a brunch or something. Yeah, literally. Yeah, it was. And it was just like these really fancy. And then we left that night, like. Yeah, and they're all just like this on their phones, like Instagramming the whole thing while, like, uh, while they're <laughs> on the dance floor, and like, and then we had to get back on the boat that night at like 3 a.m. and drive through the pitch black to get back. So it was like it was like a fever. Like a small little like dinghy boat. <laughs> I learned that. I was like <laughs> in the like, middle of a little middle of, like I don't even know like the pitch Gulf black, or and I was like, yo, if some other boat pulled up, like you wouldn't even see. Like it was like. Yeah, but they're like, yeah, we just don't have to deal with, you know, the passports. I'm like, yeah, this is fully illegal. With your <laughs> don't rich people have it good? Don't like, like the rules that apply to them. Yeah. Still. I mean, the place was insane, though. It was like, because Necker Island, that's what it's called. I guess he had just got hit with the hurricane. But you couldn't even tell because they rebuilt the whole thing. I guess it just the whole thing got wiped out. And he's like, all right, just do it again. And they just like built the whole thing again. Wow. So, must wow. be nice. Well, that story didn't disappoint. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And you and I feel like you guys could be doing that like you know once a week or something. That's what you should tell people. We're like just like flying around. I wouldn't mind doing that shit once a week. Yeah, that's the best part of being a DJ because you just show up with a little USB stick like this. I, I feel like back in the day, like 
the the apex for being DJ is if you could play Diddy's White Party. That was yeah, like that the thing was to do. DJ Cassie was like. I'm guy. honestly trying to move into more of those types of like <laughs> one off like private big money gigs as we a all DJ. Are. Like, yeah. Every, every and like with like go go dancers and like silver body suits. Like, so, I, listen, it, it just whatever the whatever the accoutrement. Yeah. As long as it's <laughs> worth the journey. All right, guys. Well, we got to go. Thank you so much for joining us on Real Jordan and Demi. Thanks for having us. It was a pleasure. J. Pat B. Rock, The Knox. The new album is out when? I, I didn't even talk about the release date. Uh, we haven't announced the release date, but it's, it's right. uh, early next year, though. Early next year. Okay. Yeah. All right. So look out for that. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. Demi, that was fun. The Knox. They have worked with so many people. It's ridiculous. And that Richard Branson story, I feel like there's, they have two dozen of those just like chilling there that they could have told us. It's also good. I mean, we've had, going back to like the TikTok new artists, just new artists in general, yeah. um, that have that can make use of the internet and having access to people by the snap of their fingers. It's really nice to have on artists that have a foundation, built the foundation, and uh, made their way to the top kind of like, the real way, you know, you know, and they talked a lot about there is no, uh, there's no, um, scene here in New York and all that kind of stuff, but, but there's still connections being made, you know, uh, your friends with blue and they and they helped, you know, the pr production stuff with blue and blue played bass for them. And so like, there's connections being made all around us, you know? Yeah, I definitely, yeah, I definitely would say the scene may not be what it was because there's so many different people coming to New York and trying to do music. But people do like to come out and have a good time still. So and I, I think that will never change. I do get, give your props for your turtleneck. You're looking very California today. California. Looks like you're about ready to go to Napa Valley on a wine tour. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. But you're liking it out there, right? You, you're digging it more than you more than you were? I love it. It's it's a problem, Jordan. And we always you can go back to episodes. We used to shit on New York. I mean uh LA. It's yeah, Freudian slip there. Yeah. All right. So we will be back next week. And of course, go to uh Facebook, YouTube, uh TikTok, anywhere. We're uploading a lot of TikToks these days, little clips, little nuggets from the show. So please check us out there. And of course, you can Listen to our whole archive at popdust.com or Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Music, wherever you listen to your podcasts. So until next time, we'll see you later. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.